Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here again, and we have our marathon lecture. Good news is today it's testing midterm week, so we're not going to go crazy today. We'll get out a little bit early. Uh, it is week six, and this is the Thursday lecture marathon. Okay, we left off with stomach lining conditions, and these are always, I don't know, students have trouble with these things. The authors, part of the problem is the authors have such a mess. You're going to see AKAs like you've never seen before. And yeah, so experts have created an absolute mess, and you'll see what I mean here in a second. Rubens and Robbins, no exception, just a mess with regard to this, with naming these things. And they knew that, and it was even worse before, from what I understand. In 1994, these world experts got together in Sydney, Australia. And even before, I think it was in 1980-something, but then they, in 1994, they got together again and they came up with the updated Sydney classification system, which is a system that attempts to better categorize the gastrotides. Um, those are the gastritis's. That's the plural gastrotides, I guess is one way to say the plural of gastritis is because gastritis, how do you say gastritis is, is gastrotides. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, many of the authors in modern days are not embracing these, including Robbins and Rubens. Um, nevertheless, we'll, we'll just do the best we can. So chronic gastritis via the updated Sydney classification system. So chronic gastritis, much more common than acute gastritis. Acute gastritis is if you go out Friday night and have seven shots of moonshine and you wake up the next day and your stomach is just very upset and it takes three, two, three days for it to get better. You have just experienced an acute gastritis which is actually a terrible word because it has nothing to do with the inflammation. It's the alcohol has flat out burned a hole in your, your mucosal layer. Uh, but that's an acute. Chronic gastritis goes on and on for at least three months. So these are stomach problems that go on for a long time. And the symptom, of course, is dyspepsia. We've talked about that in the last lecture. These can be a completely symptomatic too, so you don't always have pain with these things, but they, how do you find out that you did have a problem as we come down with cancer? Because the these chronic gastritis can lead to cancer if you don't, especially HP, if you don't take care of that. Why do we care about them? Because they are also the underlying root cause of some wicked problems like peptic ulcer disease. Maybe we'll get to that. We'll see. Gastric hyperplastic polyps. I cut all that stuff out. It's a little more rare. We just don't. There's so much material here. So we cut that one out. Malignant gastric neoplasms. Fancy way to say stomach cancer. Uh, so that's these chronic gastritis can morph into those conditions as we will see. Horrible mess, as I said again. Um, yeah, just a horrible mess. You can read that if you want. You'll see what I mean in a second. So let's look at the way to properly classify these according to the updated Sydney. And I'll put Robins in here for, for boards, too, because you need to know what they're going to call it on boards. Right, here's the updated. Here's part of it. So we're going to talk about non-atrophic gastritis today. We're going to talk about the two types of atrophic gastritis. One of them we've touched on a little bit, right? We've talked about autoimmune disease, how it causes pernicious anemia, and those patients go on. Some of them have an atrophic autoimmune gastritis. Rubens calls that diffuse atrophic gastritis. Or Robbins calls it that. And then in another section, they call it chronic atrophic gastritis. And then in another section, they call it autoimmune chronic atrophic gastritis. Drives you crazy. We'll get to those, though, when we, uh, when we get. I'm just kind of showing you where we're going. 
So two types of atrophic, we're pretty f kind of familiar with the type 3 antibodies and everything. We're, we're familiar with the autoimmune atrophic gastritis, but how about multifocal atrophic gastritis? That can also destroy the stomach, and that one's a little more mysterious. And so we'll, we'll, that's where we're going. Then we'll talk about the the special forms. Under We're not going to talk, I took all those out because there's just not enough time. But there are several special forms of gastritis, uh, including chemical gastritis. And the example I just gave you was with alcohol. So these are things that you ingest, like NSAIDs and bile and, uh, yeah, things like that. And they just rip up your stomach. So many experts are really trying on the next Sydney meeting to get rid of this word gastritis. Because it's better, gastropathy is a better word. Because uh, this, these are not inflammation-induced. There may be inflammation after the original insult occurs, but bile and alcohol, NSAIDs, those are the problem. There's other special forms, too. There's radiation from chemotherapy. You can rip up your stomach. There's a lymphocyte, heavy inflammation that occurs. Uh, there's Crohn's disease. These are the non-infectious granuloma. Uh, granulomatous gastritis, Crohn's disease is one, sarcoidosis, eosinophilic gastritis is another one. Similar to the eosinophilic esophagitis, you could also have the same thing in your stomach. So then we've got HPE again, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So the updated Sydney classification system, the three main categories again are non-atrophic gastritis, atrophic gastritis, and special forms of gastritis. So let's start with the non-atrophic. Is the stomach going to be destroyed in this one? It's going to be atrophied. And when I mean atrophied, I mean the stomach isn't all shrunken up. It's microscopically atrophied. The fundic glands are destroyed. Uh, or the stomach glands are destroyed, things like that. No, this is non-atrophic, so you go in there histologically, and you're not going to see a destroyed stomach lining. So this is the first category. Um, there is a whole bunch of AKAs. Okay, you ready for these things? Here we go. Here's the AKAs for non-atrophic gastritis. Oh, my gosh, there's Bones, original Star Trek. That's the ship doctor. Yeah, this is it's really ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, so non-atrophic gastritis. Some of these we got to learn, though, because Robbins calls this HP-associated gastritis. So that's a pretty good AKA because it tells you exactly what the cause. It is an HP infection, uh, but it also gives away what the, uh, what the disease is. Uh, so in another section, they call it HP gastritis. So he's always got HP in there somewhere. The three gas, the three AKs from Robbins. Uh, these AKs, I think Rubens actually is in our board book calls it a diffuse antrogastritis or antropodominant gastritis. And this is, as we'll see, it's because HP. When you first get an infection with HP, it goes for that the antral region of the stomach. It leaves the fundus alone, as we'll see. The other one you got to watch out for is type B. Type A gastritis is for autoimmune. Type B is non-atrophic gastritis. And then we'll look at a type AB a little bit, a little later. Uh, so I would know some of these. Okay, what a mess. Notice the four words, though. The key words are HP. I don't think board questions are going to use that because it gives it away. But I like the antral, uh, the non-atrophic, uh, and the type B. Okay, uh, oh, I'm still upset. Oh, there's shame, shame, Robin, shame. So the, the problem with the HP, so Robbins calls it HP or H. pylori gastritis. The problem with that is that we'll see atrophic gastritis also is caused by HP. So it's like you can't have both of those. So it's a really, really bad AKA, and I hope, hope they do away with that one because it it just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, 
All right. So again, the non-atrophic gastritis, it doesn't cause stomach atrophy. So histologically, you do a evaluation, take biopsies, and you're not going to have any, uh, nothing there. That's why where non-atrophic comes from. So what is it caused by? This little bugger right here. Uh, this is a H. pylori infection. H. pylori almost always attacks the antral region of the stomach first. It leaves the histological fundus, so it leaves the fundus away alone. It leaves the body of the stomach alone, if you want to talk in anatomical terms. Many years later, 15, 20, 25, even 30 years later, it can take over the entire stomach and become an atrophic gastritis at that point. But that's not where it first attacks. It attacks the antral region first. Okay, and the patients are not always symptomatic with this bug. They can have it and not be symptomatic, but with the passage of time, it can damage the stomach to the point it can become cancerous, as we will see. Epidemiology, this is a big problem. The kind of world has caught on to it, though, and they're, they're wiping this bug out. So that's a good thing in some ways. Um, so studies have demonstrated a prevalence of 100% in people over 70. Another well-done study by the Veterans Affair Council showed that 80% of patients with upper GI complaints and were having upper GI studies for dyspepsia, they had an HP infection. So that just shows you how, how strongly associated with chronic stomach pain is. If you have chronic stomach pain or dyspepsia and you haven't had HP, you should fire your GI doc for one if you have one, uh, because that it, and GI docs know that, right? They're gonna. That's the first thing they're gonna do. Primary docs hopefully will be smart enough to test for that. And if not, you can send patients for these types of tests as well. All right. Um, so if you if you do a, to make the diagnosis, you have to do a sample. Right? You can't see HP with the endoscope. You have to do histological sampling, and you'll find HP. You'll also find no signs of atrophic gastritis, no autoimmune attack, because the pyloric glands will be fine. There'll be no stomach gland atrophy of any kind. Uh, there might be an inflammation of the antrum because of the HP irritating it, and the troops come in. But the cause of the inflammation... It's not autoimmune. It's because there's a bug that has gotten too close to the mucosal layer. And the inflammation is what causes the dyspepsia because that gets down into the lamina propria. What's the sequelae of the bug? So who cares if there's a bug there? What, what does it do? Well, one thing it does is it stimulates who, what type of cell lives in the antrum. Those are G cells, right? We have pyloric glands, but here's a pyloric gland. It has G cells in it, it has ECL cells in it, it, has D cells in it, but it doesn't have parietal gland, it doesn't have chief or parietal cells, it doesn't have chief cells, but it does have these G cells. And the bugs, I mean, the bugs would be coming down in here like this, uh, and they're, this is all infected. Right, I guess there's one right there. It stimulates that G cell and irritates it, starts an inflammation. And as I said a couple times before, when a cell gets irritated by inflammation, how does it let you know? Well, the only thing it can do is release its product, and its product is gastrin. And so the HP stimulates a massive release of gastrin continuously and without regulation. There's no way to turn it off. And so these patients, if you do blood work on them, they have hypergastrinemia, right? And we know the process, right? The ECL cells are stimulated by gastrin. Gastrin binds right to parietal cells as well. So you got kind of a double direct and indirect system for making acid because of all this extra gastrin. 
Therefore, what's something else? So the blood work is going to show hypergastrinemia. You'll have hyperchlorhydria. won't be in the blood, but it'll be in the stomach biopsy. Too much acid. You have to test that with like a mammometry thing. All right, so here's, we've seen this before. There's the HP bug irritating the G cell. The G cell is releasing its payload, which is gastrin, comes out the basal lateral surface, swims. It wouldn't have to swim this far, but in this cartoon, it has to swim way over here to the interstitium, to the lymph capillary, or to the uh, microcirculation, the capillary. Gets in the capillary. Now you have gastrin flowing through the stomach region. And it drops off, stimulates the ECL cell to release histamine. Histamine binds to its H2 receptor and parietal cells, and now you got hydrochloric acid released. Intrinsic factor too. And it can also bind directly to CCK2 receptors, stimulate, stimulate the release of those same things, hydrogen ion and intrinsic factor. If you're shaky, remember I published a, a link for you guys to watch that video because I've been told not to go over that with you. It'll waste too much time. And the dean said you should know that stuff, and it's not my job to reteach it to you. But if you're shaky, go back and and read and study that so you understand this stuff because I'm going to assume, I'm going to test you on it. I assume you're going to know that stuff. And so what, what, what else does all this acid do? Well, you got tons of acid coming out without being turned out. That's not a good thing. can burn a hole in your stomach, can burn a hole in your small bowel, and that causes PUD, peptic ulcer disease. It can also, with all the acid around, you're going to get more regurgitation of acid. So you're going to rip up your esophagus with acid, so you get ulcerative esophagitis, you'll get, and that could progress into Barrett's esophagus. I mean, that could progress into cancer, I could have added there just as easily. The acid can also go out the uh, pyloric sphincter and soak the duodenum with too much acid, and you can irritate the stomach uh, tissue there. That could cause dyspepsia. And if something isn't done, the cells of the esophagus, or the duodenum will mutate into a stomach type of cell, something that can better handle that acid. So you get duodenal metoplasia of the epithelial tissue there as well. Yep, just what I said. Excess acid can easily spill over into the duodenal bulb and the distal esophagus. It leads to intestinal metaplasia or precancerous conditions. Everything I said already. And do a dental bulb, everything I also said. So that too much acid can cause the tissue to morph into a new, t actually a stomach type. It's what are no goblet cells, but it, they secrete mucose cells. And then uh, so it's interesting. So it protects the duodenum because it becomes, I like the word gastronized. Remember, we, we get intestinalization of the esophagus but we get gastrinalization uh, of the stomach because we get a stomach type of simple columnar epithelium without goblet cells, but those are all those are all those mucose cells they are able to secrete mucus, so you can you get much more mucus secretion that way. Okay, and then you have real if you have real stomach tissue in your duodenum, what's the problem with that? You got it. You can get an HP infection of that, of your duodenum now, right? And another problem, if you have stomach tissue growing in your duodenum, well, what else is that stomach tissue going to do? It's going to make acid. So you're going to have some ulcers way downstream, maybe even in the jejunum because of this. And then you can support HP. You got HP growing in your stomach, and now you got it growing in your your small bowel or small intestine, or specifically your duodenum. What's the treatment for non-atrophic gastritis? Treat the bug. So it's a double course of antibiotics. It has a decent chance of knocking out that HP. 
there goes your problem. Um, although sometimes the pain still continues, as we'll see in a bit. Uh, and then you treat it just like you would GERD. Too much acid, you got to tr sh try to shut that off, the acid off. You might not do very good at it, but you can cut down on the acid by using proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers. Uh, endoscopic monitoring to make sure cancer doesn't pop up. You can use some painkillers for the dyspepsia. Acetaminophen is better. No uh, no aspirin or no no anything that will irritate the stomach like NSAIDs. Acetaminophen typically does not irritate the stomach. I can tell you from personal experience, I have a delicate stomach and can't take hardly anything except acetaminophen. I don't have any trouble with that. Same with I have many clients who don't have trouble. That's a good one to take for pain. Just got to watch your liver enzymes so if you take a lot of it. What is the max dose of Tylenol? We all see those. You can go to the store, you buy the 500 milligram pills. Anybody know what that is? It's 4,000 milligrams a day. I've got clients who've been on 3,500 milligrams for decades. As long as they get their livers tested, they have they do okay. Uh, you got to be careful not to go over that, that marker, though, because people have blown their livers out. Um, anyway, let's see. So fun facts, about 25% of the patients with dyspepsia, uh, the pain doesn't stop. Right, a dyspepsia doesn't stop after the HP has been eradicated, so we don't quite understand that. That's probably how come people still have pain after disc herniation and they have surgery and the disc herniation is removed. Or natural mother nature can also make some disc herniations disappear without doing anything. But how come some are still left with pain? Well, they probably became sensitive, become sensitized to that. Central sensitization is a phenomenon, get extra substance P, there's a lot of stuff about that. But it is well known, we've already talked about how dyspepsia patients can be oversensitive to things like acid, like lipid, volume, things like that. So it might take a while to kind of reset the wiring in these patients. What about spontaneous regression? Can the HP just all of a sudden disappear? It actually can. So there's some research on this. About 10% of the cases, uh, the HP just packs up and leaves. Uh, so that's interesting. We don't know the whole story with that. Um, but it does happen. Could take a couple of years, but can happen. Okay. Now let's get to the atrophic gastritis. So now we're, we just covered these up here, types of gastritis. We just covered non-atrophic. That's an easy one. That's just HP is the problem. Just got to watch out for these. Well, how come it's called diffuse antral gastritis? Because it only affects the antrum, right? Chronic antral gastritis only affects the antrum. That's where those came from. And then type B is an older AKA. Um, that is the opposite of type A, which is we're going to look at right now. So atrophic gastritis is now we're going to have some histological findings. There's two subcategories. There's autoimmune, multifocal, atrophic gastritis. Yeah, let's see. Excuse me. It's late. I've had a long day today. What time is it? It's like 10 o'clock, I think. It's Wednesday night before your lecture, before your class. A little behind this week. Uh, let's see. All right, so those are the two subtypes. Let's just get into it. So autoimmune atrophic, that's the second category, as we said. There's two main subdivisions, just said that. Autoimmune atrophic gastritis, multifocal atrophic gastritis. Let's take a look at autoimmune. We're pretty good with this one. Oh my gosh, what another freaking mess. I don't know why they don't clean this up, uh, but they don't. Autoimmune gastritis. So autoimmune gastritis. Yamada, that's the king of all GI books right there. I think that's like $600. Mm -hmm. 
very, very well done reference. You can watch, you can see some of it in Google Books, although Google Books is going downhill, which is sad. Um, autoimmune chronic atrophic gastritis. A lot of them at least have a common course. Diffuse atrophic gastritis is Robbins. So at least it's got atrophic, chronic atrophic gastritis is another Robbins, a.k.a. within the same book. Autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis, at least we have atrophic gastritis in there. The, the hard one is type A gastritis or type A con, chronic gastritis. That just means that A is for autoimmune. Uh, watch out for this one, diffuse, not antral, but now we have diffuse corporal gastritis. What does corporal mean? means body. So this is the body, basically, of the stomach. This is the fundic region of the stomach. Pernicious anemia associated. So you could probably figure those out, I bet. Subcategories. So the autoimmune atrophic gastritis, again, it's a subcategory under the Sydney atrophic gastritis category. It is caused by an autoimmune attack of the fundic region of the stomach, not the pyloric region, not where HP was ripping it up. So this one is in the fundic region of the stomach, and the antrum is spared in this condition. So the autoimmune attack is going to rip up the parietal cells, as we'll see, and it leads to a chronic autoimmune-related inflammation, destroys glands of the body and stomach typically spares the antrum again so out of the gastritis pie it makes up less than 10 percent so it's not super common hp associated non-atrophic gastritis is the number one cause of all of these gastritis is by far this one is seen this autoimmune is seen more in caucasians especially with scandinavian background or descent there's some genes for this. It's an auto, uh, also a recessive trait that's been found. So it is familial. And the antibodies, yeah, you can do a test for this. And about 90% of those affected will have, in fact, we know, we already know who it'll have. It'll have the type 3 autoantibody. And the sequelae of the autoimmune attack, parietal cells get destroyed is the sequelae. And the inflammation, we've talked about this with pernicious anemia, the inflammation affects the entire oxentic gland to the point that the neighbors of the parietal cells get destroyed, the chief cells get destroyed. So eventually the entire oxentic gland or fundic gland, whatever you want to call it, aka, it gets destroyed as well. And uh, there goes your hip, right? You take out your fundic gland or your AKA oxentic gland. There goes your hipster. No hydrochloric acid, no intrinsic factor, no pepsinogen. So how are you going to absorb vitamin B12 if there's no pepsinogen or no hydrochloric acid? You're not. So what are you going to get? Vitamin B12 deficiency, right? You're going to get pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, and then ultimately megaloblastic anemia. Uh, the sequelae of the autoimmune attack. So we're not going to get hyperchlorhydria this time. So just the opposite of the other one. We're going to get hypochlorhydria. So hypochlorhydria will in turn turn off the antral D cells. Uh, so gastrin, remember, uh, remember when you get hypochlorhydria, it turns off the antral D cells. Remember that? So the gastrin will begin, nothing will shut off the gastrin is what I'm trying to say. So the antral D cells turned off from uh, basic stomach conditions. Uh, so the G cells run wild. There's nothing to turn them off. Uh, therefore, these patients will have hypergastrinemia also. Uh, so this type and the last type, both these patients both have hypergastrinemia. So what's the sequelae? The fundic D cells. Uh, so they get overworked. Remember, gastrin stimulates them to produce somatostatin. And so they get overworked and get hypertrophied. 
right? ECL cells, they get stimulated by gastrin, so they get overwork and get hypertrophied. Uh, so that causes hyperplasia of the G cells and the ECL cells and the fundic D cells, if you want to throw those in there as well. Chronic inflammation will eventually stimulate nociceptors in the lamina propria and cause pain. You'll get dyspepsia from this. All right. Oh, no, here's this thing again. Uh, but remember how the, the pH here. So if the parietal cell can't produce acid, there's nothing that can stimulate this, this D cell to do its job. So no somatostatin is released in the antrum. So there's nobody to turn off the G cell. So the G cell, even though these maybe ACTH and GRIP or GRP might not be working, I mean, maybe they will. If you eat food, they're going to work anyway. But if you're not eating food, there's nothing to turn this off. So you're always releasing gastrin. You have hypergastrinemia. Remember, the gastrin goes over here and it binds to the D cells. These are the fundic D cells, the ones in the fundic region. So these guys are overworked. What do they do? They secrete somatostatin, which is turning off the parietal cell, and it's turning, it's hitting the ECL cell, turning that off as well. Kind of weird, because we got turn off signals hitting the parietal cell and ECL cells, and then we got gastrin also stimulating them. So we got two opposing forces hitting the parietal cell. And so it's just a big mess. It's an endocrinology mess right here. But it doesn't matter because the parietal cells are broken, right? Because there's an autoimmune attack inside of them. Uh, and in fact, the entire fundic gland. So forget this stuff. You don't make that. All right, see how all that works. How about some associations? Yep, those affected, this is an autoimmune disease, so those affected with this disease also have increased chance to get psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Autoimmune thyroid diseases like Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, about 33% have that. A third of the patients with autoimmune atrophic gastritis also have Hashimoto's. Type 1 diabetes, Sjogren's disease, rosacea. Where rosacea? Yeah, they think rosacea might have something, an autoimmune component as well. We'll look at this when we get in seventh quarter, but there's a severe end phase. Girls usually don't go through that. It's more of a guy thing. Uh, but their noses get really big and granulomatous. Look at the cheeks, all these granulomas, fibroblasts, heavy inflammation, autoimmune driven, and the nose gets really big. Saw the episode on the pimple popper. Uh, how she treated that and tried to re-sculpt the nose on a patient who had this type of advanced stage 4 rosacea. That's called rhinophyma. Rhinophyma, when the nose gets filled with granulomatous tissue like that. How about more associations? Well, just like pernicious anemia, this autoimmune atrophic gastritis is also associated with iron deficiency anemia which causes classic symptoms, fatigue, and maybe a little white-looking, pyloric-looking, get that thready pulse, dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, all things saying that your heart needs to speed up pumping the blood because the blood is not containing enough oxygen. Risk for cancer, yeah, there's a three-time, not a gigantic risk, but there's a three-time risk for developing uh, one of the gastric carcinomas. What do you do? What's the treatment for autoimmune atrophic gastritis? Uh, well, just like pernicious anemia, you're probably going to have to get injections of vitamin B12 eventually. So you have to monitor those B12 levels. You can give the patient immunosuppressants because it is an autoimmune attack. So you calm down the, uh, the immune system of the body. It'll help with the symptoms. Not good though if you get coronavirus, right? You need to be, you should not be taking any immunosuppressants unless you absolutely have to. You know, check that with your doctor, but that makes you vulnerable to, to the really bad infection by coronavirus. 
uh, watch out for iron deficiency anemia and take pain meds as needed, right? But not NSAIDs or it's got to be really just Tylenol. Some more fun facts. Patients with autoimmune atrophic gastritis are protected. What? How can they be protected from GERD and PUD, Barrett's esophagus, esophageal carcinoma? How can they be protected? How's the, are they making acid? No. How come they're not making acid? Parietal glands are wrecked. Right? That's why. So at least they don't have that problem to worry about. Do they have hypergastrinemia? Yes, they do. There's nothing to shut that off. Endoscopic assessment, so it will not be negative like the last time. So there will be damage in the, or the antrum and cardio will not be damaged. The pyloric antrum and the cardio of the stomach, they don't have fundic glands. But the fundic region, in other words, the body and the fundic, fundus of the stomach will be damaged, sometimes severely atrophied from long-term autoimmune attack. To the point you lose rugae, the rugae can disappear. Right? There's a nice, beautiful rugae. Here's a patient with chronic autoimmune atrophic gastritis. I think we've looked at that with pernicious anemia. But rugae are completely destroyed. And that was just up toward the, I mean, that's heading toward the, the fundus, that region. So this is just the body. Pyloric region is typically spared. Okay, I said there's another cause of atrophic gastritis, not just autoimmune. And the other cause is multifocal atrophic gastritis. And yeah, the little baby's amazed. And not quite as bad as the other ones, but still quite a few. MAG, environmental metaplastic atrophic gastritis. Type AB gastritis is a classic one. HP-associated atrophic gastritis, terrible one to use because we know HP is also associated with non-atrophic gastritis, so we should stay away from those. Atrophic pangastritis, is, uh, OTSA uses that one. Uh, so we'll call it multifocal. Robbins uses multifocal. Rubens also uses most multifocal, so at least they're on the same page with this. Uh, the other thing I should tell you is what is the word pan mean? Pan means a f like the entire stomach is affected and the entire wall of the stomach is affected. It's like everything. So it's the second type of atrophic gastritis. Uh, autoimmune was the first. There's two causes of this. So the most common one in about 75% of the patients it's a chronic HP infection. So it started off as a non-atrophic gastritis, and over years and years and years, the HP took over the entire stomach. That's the usual case scenario here. You get yourself a chronic HP infection. And then 25% of the time, they don't have HP, yet their stomach is destroyed. And they believe it's some environmental like pollution or cigarette smoke or they haven't been able to figure it out yet though. So we'll just leave it as unknown environmental factor. There's some theories, but none of them are really uh, supported that well. So unlike autoimmune atrophic gastritis, which spares the antrum, mag destroys everything. So this is considered a pangastritis. The entire stomach is taken out by this one. And this one, think cancer. When you think of MAG, think cancer, because this is the one that greatly increases the risk of developing cancer. Uh, Rubens, oh, come on, Rubens. Rubens says that the ideology is unknown and says that's a precursor to cancer. Uh, so that's not true because most of the time it's a chronic HP infection, right? Only, was it 25% of the time it's unknown, so Robbins makes it, or Rubens makes a very confusing statement there. They need to clean that up. 
Many cases, it's believed to be the result of a progression, we already said it, of non-atrophic gastritis. And HP or some unknown factor eventually gets into the entire stomach and destroys it. How do you know if you have an HP infection? So kind of getting off the subject here. But I mean, most mag is caused by HP. How do you know? Uh, well, you can do a blood test. You look for antibodies. It's IgG type. Uh, and uh, there's a specific test that you can use. Blood test. But what's the problem with that? If you've had HP in the past and you eradicated it with antibiotics, you'll always have those antibodies. So you can't use the blood test. You could only use the blood test for the very first time when you're younger. When you're older, you need to use the urea breath test. Or you can, I mean, you could get a stomach biopsy and that would tell, that's the gold standard. But you can actually, they called the breath test. I've had this before. Uh, they actually uh, give you something to drink that kills the HP and releases that, temporarily kills it, but it kills enough of them to release some of that urea. Remember, HP are surrounded by a cloud of urea, and they can detect that in your breath, and then you blow really hard out into a little collecting device, and they collect your breath and test it. So it's pretty accurate if it's done correctly. And um, that's the only way you can also know if the infection was successfully treated because there's no, we can't measure antibody. There's no way to tell if the right combination of bacteria uh, even, even worked, right? Some docs, they don't know enough to give you a double course of antibiotics. They give you a single course, decent chance it won't kill it off. How do you know? And then the doc never orders a follow-up urea breath test. I can tell you stories about a doc who did that, and I had to remind him that, oh, he was going to order a blood test. I had to remind him that the antibodies will be there whether uh, whether it's there or not. And so I had to tell him, remember the urea breath test? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary out there. All right. Uh, not uncommon for HP to eventually kill itself off. So one of the things with multi with mag multifocal atrophic gastritis, the HP can eventually kill itself off. How does it do that? Well, it doesn't kill itself, but it kills these, all the glands of the stomach so bad that there's nowhere for it to live, and it has to have mucosal glands to live. Without them, it dies. So it does kill itself off sometimes. But before that happens, all that beautiful epithelium, simple columnar mucosal cell epithelium is destroyed. Uh, it's not always HP too. Uh, so occasionally HP is not the cause of gastritis. Uh, HP testing uh, is negative. Uh, so that's what we're talking about, mag still. Kind of that slides out of place, I think. We talked about that. There's some environmental toxin. We're not unsure what it is. There's some weird thing. All right, so now let's get into special forms. And I said I cut all the special forms out, but here are the special forms. That'd make a nice test question, wouldn't it? All of the following are included in the special forms category of or special forms of gastritis category via the Sydney classification system, except blank. Then which one's not there? Chemical gastritis is the one we're going to focus on. I already went through these. Radiation, lymphocytic gastritis, non-infectious granulomatous gastritis, eosinophilic gastritis, etc. We're just going to work on chemical gastritis. Uh, so it's not a good thing to call this chemical gastritis because, as I said before, if it's from alcohol or it's from bile or NSAIDs, that's got nothing to do. The cause is not and inflammation. So it's better to call it a gastropathy. And there's a movement. Some of the experts want to change this in the next Sydney meeting to gastropathy and not gastritis. There's a bunch of AKs for this too. So um, the one I really like is reactive gastropathy. That's a great one because it got rid of the itis. Trouble is Robbins and Rubens don't use it. Uh, but Schlesinger and a lot of other the big really well-written books do use it. Uh, reactive gastropathy, Mayo Clinic uses that one. 
Another one, acute erosive gastritis, gastropathy. Slicinger tries to appease everybody. Hemorrhagic, acute hemorrhagic gastritis. That's a Russo. Acute gastritis, reflux gastritis, NSAID gastritis, alcohol-induced gastropathy. Robbins calls it chronic gastritis. I mean, what the hell is that? They're all chronic gastritis, is Robbins. Why would you call it chronic gastritis? Uh, so that's just a lame one. I don't know. They need to, oh, that book. Don't get me started. Type C gastritis. Yeah. So many of these are bad terms because there is typically not much inflammation. So none of them should really be gastritis. I really like that reactive gastropathy. Uh, or, I mean, if we're st staying with Sydney, we can call it chemical gastritis. But I'm warning you, hint, hint, I do like reactive gastropathy because it's a problem with the stomach that reacted to something you drank, or something you took. So that's a better one. This is where the traditional acute gastritis is typically are placed, like drinking alcohol, or drinking antifreeze, or moonshine. So those are acute gastritis are placed here. And according to Sydney Mayo, uh, these include alcohol, bile reflux, NSAID injury, and some other agents like accidental poisonings with, with antifreeze and things like that. So the condition is a sudden acute onset of pain following something you took. And it can rapidly bleed. You can have hemoptysis, hematemesis, coffee ground vomitus are all possible depending on how much blood is in the stomach. And all of the all of these the mechanism is the same. It go it burns a hole right through the gastric mucosal memory. There's nothing wrong with the GMB. It just can't handle alcohol or moonshine or antifreeze. Uh, it just burns a hole in it. Uh, same with NSAIDs. You always take NSAIDs on a full stomach because they they're acid. They'll burn. They'll burn the stomach lining. And let's see. So typically, the something, whether it be alcohol or NSAIDs or whatever, antifreeze or whatever. Uh, it does not cause a significant inflammatory filtrate. In fact, if you do a biopsy, there'll be hardly any neutrophils in it. So it's a terrible, gastritis is a terrible word. I've said that like a bunch of times. Histologically speaking, uh, there will be some destruction of the epithelial cells with a hyperplasia. There'll be no dysplasia. This is more of an acute type thing. So, But the cells may be... People, chronic alcoholics, they'll have hyperplastic cells. Uh, so the mucose cells will be very thick. They may not start stop working so well. Um, there's that reactive gastropathy I'm introducing. I do like that. What about endoscopically? Can you see anything? Oh, yeah. When you go in there, you'll see the stomach ripped up. You usually see these red streaks in the mucosa, uh, like it's been damaged by something. There'll be hemorrhage, some erosions. Maybe a lot of blood in the stomach if there's an ulcer that's formed. That's one of the AKAs. It was acute hemorrhagic gastropathy because of that phenomenon. We'll just jump right to the uh, stomach that's been beat up uh, by this. Uh, so this is the pyloric antrum, which doesn't have rugae down that far. Uh, and it's all raw looking, right? It's all raw and red. All right, some other causes of chemical gastritis, aspirin. And if you take a couple, that's not going to be a big deal, right? But if you stay on them for six months or so, that cumulative, that acid is going to start to rip up your stomach. And, and a lot of people, some people have a cast iron stomach, nothing bothers them. But some people don't. NSAID's the same kind of deal. Uh, high proof ethanol like moonshine and stuff like that you want to rip your stomach up you start drinking that stuff uh, probably the most common cause is a of chemical gastritis is alcohol consumption um, it can really rip up your stomach as probably a lot of us including me i was in college one time 
Um, I won't tell you the Walt, Walt May story this quarter, but... Yeah, Walt May lived on a farm, and they raised moonshine. They had moonshine, and he'd always bring it down, and uh, lots of crazy stories with that stuff. But remember, alcohol directly injures the superficial epithelial cells, cuts right through the gastric mucosa, nothing can stop it. The higher the proof, the easier it defeats the gastric mucosal barrier. Moonshine is 90% alcohol on average, so it's pretty wicked. Jack Daniels is 80 proof or 40% alcohol, uh, so it's, yeah, it's wicked stuff. There's this famous study where they took four ounces of alcohol and had people swallow it, different concentrations of alcohol, and then they'd stuck an endoscope down there to see what happened to them. I think a bunch of college students signed up for this thing. Empty stomachs. So concentration of 12%, uh, which is like wine these days, red wine. Most wines can get up this high. Uh, there's already visible changes in just 60 minutes. There's hyperemia, even a little petechiae in some people within 60 minutes. And that's nothing. That's just a glass of wine, four ounces of wine, a little glass of wine. So when you get up to concentrations of over 40%, like 151, right, Bacardi 151, things like that, there was serious damage done. Uh, there was necrosis done. There was tiny hemorrhage going on. And yeah, the old saying, don't drink on an empty stomach, is certainly true. I always, I can't, I can't see these comments. I wanted to warn you about this, but yeah, this is not a pleasant view. You can see she's been severely, severely burned. And my question is, why is she on the chemical gastritis page? I'll tell you why, because her, as well as many people who are burned this severely, if they survive, they get stomach ulcers. Yeah, stomach ulcers. Let me take a drink of water while you think about that. Why would they get stomach ulcers? I bet not one of you figured that one out. Well, we talked a little bit about burns. What happens to the albumin concentration in their blood? It decreases like crazy. It leaks out into the interstitium. So their whole bodies swell like crazy. Does that give you a hint? No? Uh, well, not just their skin swells, but their, the interstitium everywhere swells, even in the stomach. So underneath the mucose cells, is there not an interstitium? Is there not a microcirculation? Yeah. So that swells up like crazy. So what? Well, if your interstitium is just full of too much fluid, how are you going to feed the cells? How are the mucose cells going to get food, glucose, nitrogen? How's the waste going to get out of there? It ain't. It's not going to... It's not going to get out of there very good. So you start getting mucosal cell stress and death. And you, you start losing mucosal cells in your stomach lining. There goes your gastromucosal barrier. There goes your protection from acid. And you're going to start getting ulcers. Right? And that's exactly what happens. So could a burn victim suffer chemical gastritis? Absolutely. How in the world could that be? Because albumin is lost. So you get general body swelling. So what? Well, interstitium becomes, in the interstitium underneath the mucose cells, right, that are so important, they make, remember the mucose cells, they make the gastromucosa barrier that protects your stomach. So, just as I said, they, the nutrients can't diffuse through all that congestion and cells start to die. And mucosal cells die, there goes your GMB and there goes your no physical barrier, no mucus, no PGE2. Remember how that PGE2 would go and bind to ECL cells and shut those down so they didn't release as much histamine? Uh, so, yeah, so there's all sorts of. Uh, ways. So here, here's just the 
here's a mucose cell wants to be fed and normally there's not hardly any fish here but this is all the fish of the extra interstitial fluid and here's glucose and oxygen trying to get to feed the cell and they just can't get through this big mess not a way to look at it so yeah chemical gas race uh, so there's nothing to stop the acid then the mucosal barrier is gone the, even the little acid you make will, from the stress you make some acid you'll rip a hole right in your stomach these have a special name lots of stars here these are called curling ulcers curling ulcers wow you guys hear that truck ups truck it's almost 11 o'clock those guys work very hard uh, curling ulcers so make sure you know the curling ulcers uh, those occur in burn victims uh, why because they have loss of albumin everything I just said there's a curling ulcer in the burn victim right there it's been treated it's, it's uh, looks like it's healing all right, how does NSAIDs damage the gastric mucosal barrier? Well, we already went through this ad nauseum. Um, but direct damage, first the NSAIDs directly damage the, the mucose cells, gastric mucosal barrier. But then the other whammy, the most important one, is that they knock out their COX-1 inhibitors. And we said that we need COX-1 is the enzyme that gives birth to pg e 2 So if you knock out COX-1, there goes your pg e 2 throughout your body, including the mucose cells. So you can't make pg e 2 You're going to have decreased mucus production. You're going to have decrease, increased acid production because you're not inhibiting the ECL cells from making histamine anymore. See, it all comes back to that physiology stuff. So go watch that YouTube video. Ulceration and perforations can easily occur in the stomach uh, in this type of a situation. What about some other irritants, some other causes of reactive gastropathy? What else can rip up your stomach? Mercury, heavy metal poisoning, selenium, uh, caustic corrosive agents, uh, recreational drugs, special K used to be called. I don't know if they still call it that, but uh, ketamine. So inhaled or snorted ketamine can definitely do the trick as well. Okay, that can rip up the stomach. Bile is another one. Bile is very caustic. The stomach does not like bile. For whatever reason, it cannot. You would think it could protect against bile, but it doesn't like bile. It makes you sick, makes you want to vomit. Um, and so if you have a loose pyloric sphincter, you might have trouble with bile backwash. If you get bile backwashing up into your stomach, it's very caustic. It can knock out the gastric mucosa barrier and easily cause an ulcer. Right? Uh, very difficult to tell the difference uh, between bile damage, alcohol damage, and NSAID damage. It all kind of looks the same. That's why they're all classified as reactive gastropathies or if we have to say chemical gastritis we can say that as well all right i think is that about all now i got a little more uh what's some increased risk what can increase the risk for bile reflux problems stomach surgery so if you've had a tummy tuck or lap band surgery that definitely increases the risk for it chronic respiratory diseases people with copd are coughing Anything that increases chronic abdom uh, intra abdominal pressure uh, will encourage bile to backwash into your stomach. Obesity also increases chronic intra abdominal pressure. How about the symptoms of bile reflux? S uh, upset stomach, right? Or symptoms of ulcers, up dyspepsia. Again, there might be, if you have an ulcer, hemat hemoptysis or hematemesis whether it be bright red or coffee ground vomitus. Melina, you'll have some digestive blood coming out in the stool maybe. Uh, one thing about bioreflux though, it does kill off the HP, so that's a good thing about it. 
What about the treatment for reactive gastropathy? Well, if it's alcohol, stop drinking the alcohol. So figure out what the cause is and stop it if you can. And then fight it with with proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers. Shut off the acid to let the ulcer heal. You don't have to stay on it forever, but you need to shut off the acid to help it heal. And then eat a bland diet. Modify your diet so you don't eat foods that will irritate your ulcer until it's healed up really good. And if the pyloric sphincter is loose, you might have to go tighten that thing up via surgery. All right, so I think that is enough because this will be the cutoff point for your GIGU test, which is next week. So I think that's enough material for you. And we have CVP test tomorrow. So good luck with that. It's, uh, I'm not even sure what time it is, but I'll put an announcement up in the morning. All right, see you guys later.